Hello friends, welcome to today's History of the Christian Church, 2,000 Years of Christian Thought, where today I hope to explore the life and wisdom of Irenaeus. In this podcast, we're going to delve into the insights and the enduring legacy of one of the most influential figures in early Christianity, Irenaeus of Lyon. Join us as we journey through his life and writings, his thoughts, the thoughts of this ancient theologians whose profound reflections on theology and the Christian faith continue to resonate with relevance in the contemporary world in which we live. Through some analysis, hopefully keeping it within the historical context, I aim to shed light on the enduring re relevance of his teachings and their significance for modern believers and seekers alike, even to this day. So join me as we try and hear the echoes of antiquities in the life and wisdom of Irenaeus. Hello friends, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the life and thinking of Irenaeus. Born around 130 AD and died just at the beginning of the 3rd century, probably around 202 AD. And I've subtitled today's study, Taking a Stand Against the Heretics. Irenaeus was a Greek, born in Asia Minor into a Christian family, and as a boy he listened frequently to Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, who was one of the Apostolic Fathers, the very guy we looked at in our last episode together. Polycarp was the early church leader who himself was an apostle of the Apostle John. Irenaeus was a Greek from Polycarp's hometown of Smyrna, which is present-day Izmir in Turkey. He was born during the first half of the second century. The exact date is thought to be between the years 120 and 140. Unlike many of his contemporaries, he was brought up in a Christian family rather than converting as an adult. As a young man, he moved to Lyon in modern-day Gaul in France, where he first became what was called a presbyter. Then, in around 177, he succeeded the martyred bishop there as Bishop of Lugdunium, now Lyon, in France. Nothing is known of the date of his death, which must have occurred at the end of the second or more likely the beginning of the third century. He is regarded as a martyr in the Catholic Church and also by some within the Orthodox Church. He himself was buried under the Church of St. John in Lyon, which was later renamed St. Irenaeus in his honour. However, the tomb and his remains were utterly destroyed in 1562 by the Huguenots. Irenaeus was heavily influenced by Justin Martyr, and in a sense, he represents a bridge between the early Greek theology and the Western Latin theological approach to Scripture and Christianity. Thinking about his writings, well, Justin Martyr, who we looked at last time, was at his core primarily an apologist. Irenaeus's main contribution lay in his contradiction of heresies. His major work, which was somewhat snappily titled A Refutation and an Overthrow of Knowledge, Falsely So-Called, became more generally known by the shorter title of Simply Against Heresies. This was a huge, lengthy, polemic tome of a book, but was divided up into five shorter books. In book one, he talks about Valentinian, the Valentinian Gnostics and their predecessors, who he says go all the way back as far as the magician Simon Magnus. In book two, he attempts to provide proof that Valentinianism, i.e. and all Gnosticism, contains no merit in terms of its doctrines. In book three, Irenaeus purports to show that Gnostic and other doctrines are false by providing counter-evidence gleaned from the Gospel accounts. And in the final volume, Book 5, he focuses on more sayings of Jesus, but this time adding in the letters of Paul the Apostle, demonstrating what he believed was the unity of their respective positions. The work was primarily written in opposition not just to Valentinian Gnostics, but against the wider Gnosticism arising all over the Christian world at that time in general. Today, Gnosticism is a modern term which covers a variety of 2nd century sects 
who, but they all had certain common elements. They believed in a supreme God, but one who was totally remote from the world and had no part in its creation. The creation was seen as a bungling work of a lesser deity, imperfect, and that lesser deity was often identified with the God of the Old Testament. The Gnostics believed that between this evil created world and the supreme God of heaven, there was a hierarchy of divine beings. Our bodies, being physical, of course, are only part of the second-rate created world, but our souls were said to contain a divine spark, yet still trapped within these corrupted human bodies. They taught a salvation of sorts, but they taught it simply as the escape of the soul from the body to the higher heavenly realms above. In order to reach the supreme God as they saw it, the soul needed in fact to pass through realms that existed above this world, which are controlled, they believe, by stars and planets and various potentially hostile divine beings, the sort of a hierarchy of minor gods. These minor deities existed between the created realm and the eternal God and form as a sort of hierarchical chain, so to speak, linking from one realm and level to the other. Gnosis, from which we get the word Gnostic, simply means knowledge, or perhaps a better translation would be to say secret knowledge. So they mostly taught that salvation was attained by this special secret knowledge from this Greek word Gnosis. This thinking could be understood either in a crude form of a sort of almost magic or in ways like passwords and secret knowledge that were passed on to special adherents they, and that could only be revealed to them by these earthly Gnostic priests. A bit like using special divine passwords as a way to pass up the chain to meet eventually and be connected with this supreme God. By the way, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, in my estimation, are just Latter-day Gnostics. More of that at the end. Some of the 1st and 2nd century sects understood it in a more philosophical way as a sort of existential hierarchy of self-knowledge. So right away you can see that the Gnostic system was drastically different from religions and all other forms of religions at that time and also completely different to what was emerging as Orthodox Christianity. You see, these different Gnostic groups each had their own scriptures, and they also appealed to secret traditions which they claimed to have passed down from one to another, claiming they had originally come from the Apostles. Irenaeus employed several arguments and strategies against this rising Gnosticism, of which the main ones we find in his writings were this. Firstly, he tackled it straight head on with a logical argument. Using his knowledge of Greek thought, particularly logic, he sought to expose the ludicrous nature of many of their beliefs. He challenged the Gnostic claim head on to having any secret apostolic traditions linked back to the apostles or Jesus himself. He argued that if the apostles had had any special training and knowledge to pass on, then of course they would have entrusted it to the churches that they originally founded, not that it should reappear amongst these later guys. He pointed to the different churches founded by the apostles all over the known Christian world at that time and showing how they had a continuing sense of succession and of open public preaching in all those churches since the very time they were founded until the present day, with extensive records kept. His second argument was to tackle it from a historic perspective. In support of this, he lists the leader of those churches, beginning with those who were the apostles themselves, and he says those churches scattered throughout the empire, there was a uniformity in the sense that they all taught the same doctrine. Quoting from his work against heresies, section 3, chapter 3, section 3, verse 1, he says this, All who wish to see the truth can clearly contemplate in every church the tradition of the apostles manifest throughout the whole world. We can list those who were the apostles and how they appointed bishops in the churches and their successors down to our time. 
You need not talk about anything about what these heretics suppose. The apostles had hidden mysteries, which were in the, which were the, which they argue they were in the habit of imparting to the perfectly private and in secret. Surely they would have handed them down, especially to those whom they entrusted the church's care for themselves, because they wanted their successors to be perfect and blameless in everything. In approaching his writing against the Gnostics, we need to remember that these people claimed to possess a secret oral tradition from handed down from Jesus himself. Irenaeus, on the other hand, maintained that the current Orthodox Christian bishops in different cities around the world, who were known and linked back as far as the apostles, that that oral tradition he lists as being attestably inherited from the apostles is surely the safest guide to understanding and the interpretation of scripture. Much more so than any of these supposed subsequent supposed special revelations. Irenaeus himself, of course, was writing close to the time of the apostles. He remembered, remember that he himself had known Polycarp, who was himself personally known as a disciple of the Apostle John. He was a student of John's. His dispute between Orthodox Christianity and Gnosticism showed that the differences were not just minor points of doctrine, that these were in fact two radically different religious systems developing side by side. The question which he poses, which still stands to this day, in which tradition is one more likely to find authentic Christianity among apostolic-founded churches or elsewhere among the like of these types of people? Among communities whose teaching had been open and continuous since their foundation, on all of whom knew one another, debated with one another, and decided what was true, and agreed what was a correct representation of the Christian faith. He concluded that it certainly could not be found among these Gnostic traditions, who claimed to have their ideas that are unverifiable and also were often contradictory among the different sects spread around at that time. In no other words, he was saying they're all saying different things and they disagree not only with us, but with one another. And in that, Irenaeus' arguments remain very powerful to this day. Like many modern Gnostics today, it's very, still very difficult to deal with them if you try and answer them from the New Testament or the biblical perspective alone, as he was doing. Well, today, as in the second century, the examples, the Gnostics will not accept what we call the scriptures. When we refute them from the Bible, they turn around and, shit and accuse and say that these same scriptures that we rely on are corrupted or are not correct. Therefore, they don't have any final or authoritative power. Often adding, in addition to those scriptures, they believe that they should represent their own special, secret, revealed holy books. This means that Orthodox Christianity and Gnosticism, as Irenaeus said, are not two different denominations. They are not even just two different religions. They are two completely different sets of values, ideologies, re religions founded upon two entirely different sets of scriptures and the way of approaching scripture and defining it. The question then becomes as not to which religion, but to which set of scriptures and holy writ we should go back to should we return and consider the writing and thoughts and testimony of christ and his apostles or the subsequent gnostic mystics it is this question which is answered by irenaeus's argument in all his writing and it's still powerful to this day and in fact i think there's little way it could be answered otherwise also, Irenaeus was one of the first to talk about the New Testament scripture and place it equally alongside the Old Testament. Initially, scriptures for Christians in the very early church just meant the Old Testament, but then the apostolic writings, as they were recorded, they were recorded uh, authority as well. He classified as Holy Writ 
not only the Old Testament, but most of the books which we now know today as the New Testament, at the same time excluding a large number of Gnostics, writings that were flourishing in the second century and claiming scriptural authority. They were, in fact, gaining credibility in some quarters. But at the initiation of Irenaeus and gradually during his lifetime, the agreed writings were all gathered together into what we today call the New Testament. And it's interesting to note that Irenaeus's view of the New Testament is strikingly close to ours today. In fact, it contains all four Gospels, the Book of Acts, Paul's letters, as well as some other writings. There are disagreements about a few books, like the book of Hebrews and Revelation, which we find in our modern Bible. Uh, but those discussions and deliberations only continued for a little while, and soon even those writings came to be accepted within a very short period of time. You see, before Irenaeus came along, many Christians differed as to which they think was the preferred gospel. The Christians of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, preferred the Gospel of John. The Gospel of Matthew, not surprisingly, was the most popular overall among the Jewish origin diaspora of his day. But it was Irenaeus who was pretty much first to assert that all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, were what we today describe as canonical scripture. In other words, Irenaeus demonstrated the New Testament and its teachings handed down by the apostolic creatures, apostolic teachers, is, was the thing that created that firm and final link between early tradition and the church. Irenaeus was very clear that any subsequent teaching was not meant to be added in any way to the core message of Christianity found within the Old and New Testament. It would have value in terms of devotion and insight and historical context, but it could not be added to the closed canon of Scripture. It was essentially, and this was essentially compiled in this way and closed because the Gnostics did not accept the New Testament and they wished to appeal to a never ending continuous revelation. And it was that that led Irenaeus to say, We need to codify the apostolic writings as the sole authority along with the Old Testament and that we must not appeal to tradition or subsequent revelations claimed in any way. Any appeal to tradition thereafter could only be considered correct in the sense that it was there to serve or prove the case against false teaching, Gnosticism and other false religious worldviews. Ultimately, scripture would uphold the authority of other holy scriptures. Also in his writing against heresies, chapter 1, section 10, verse 1, he says this, the church, though scattered throughout the world to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and this faith, a faith in one God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and all the sea, and all the things in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who has made flesh for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who through the prophets was proclaimed. God saving, dealing with man and the coming virgin birth, passion and resurrection from the dead, bodily ascension into heaven of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ and his second coming from heaven and the glory of the Father to sum all things and to raise up all human flesh so that he could execute just judgment upon all men. That's one mighty long sentence, but you will notice how similar and familiar it is to any of our modern creeds and testimonies of faith, even to this day. When considering Irenaeus's theology, the central point of it is the unity and the goodness of God, which of course stood in opposition to the Gnostics theory of God as these divine emanations, aeons they were often called. Irenaeus developed the Logos theology, that which he had received from Justin Martyr, of course himself being a student of him, of Polycarp, who himself, as I said, was tutored by the Apostle John. Remember, John used Logos terminology in the Gospel of John and in the letter of 1 John already. So Irenaeus often spoke of the Son and the Spirit as the hands of God, and he also spoke and referred frequently to the Son as the Logos. 
Irenaeus' theology was also important in the sense of its unity of salvation history. He really home, hammered home the idea that God's unity is reflected in how salvation history unfolds. He believed that from the beginning, God has a plan for humanity, and everything that has happened since fits that plan. He thought of humanity as starting out immature, like children who needed to grow up, and to mature into the image of God. According to Irenaeus, life on earth is intentionally tough, because through that we learn how to grow mor morally. He says that the story of Jonah and being swallowed up by a big fish is in fact an illustration of this, because only in the depths of difficulty are we more inclined to turn to God and seek his will. So even though suffering and death can seem like bad things in the temporal world, they're actually part of the process of us getting to know God better. For Irenaeus, the big moment in salvation history is when the incarnation of Jesus appear, appeared. However, he believed that God had the idea of Jesus even before creating humanity, seeing Jesus as the solution to humanity's mess. Irenaeus saw Jesus as a sort of ultimate fixer-up, undoing all the damage Adam, Adam and his fallen offspring had brought. Where Adam messed up, Jesus got it right, even to the point of dying on a cross. He then became the new Adam. This idea is also the major inspiration behind Milton's Paradise Loss. According to Irenaeus, our salvation comes entirely through God taking on human form in Jesus. He believes sin led to death and decay, but since God is immortal and incorruptible, by joining with human nature in Jesus, he was able to pass on those qualities to us. To us, it's like an inheritance, an inheritance of a good infection that spreads throughout humanity. So for Irenaeus, it's not just about Jesus dying on the cross to save us, although that's foundationally important. It's also about Jesus being human and thereby enabling us to be more like God, which in will include conquering death and corruption via our resurrection in him. Irenaeus also drew heavily on Paul's letter to shape his understanding of salvation history. He emphasised how Jesus' death brought victory over sin and evil, thereby saving humanity from Adam's fall and, of course, also Satan's ongoing influence. According to Irenaeus, Jesus' incarnation sanctified humanity, allowing to put that off and allowing them to reflect God's perfection, that which had been lost in the fall and all at once give us, restore in us the hope and prospect of life eternal. This idea, of course, mirrors Paul's teaching, which, is, which he was one of the first to stress this alongside Christ's role in forming in the ability to form a new order of things, thereby freeing humanity from the sin inherited from Adam's fall in the Garden of Eden. Irenaeus highlighted the necessity of Christ's sacrifice in overcoming evil. It was the only way in which we could raise Adam's mark on fallen human nature. And to counter the Gnostic beliefs that were arising, he used extensively Paul's letters, particularly Colossians and Ephesians, to show how Christ's sacrifice redeemed humanity wholly. He expanded on Paul's concept of Christ as the new Adam, emphasizing Christ's full humanity and the need for him to restore humanity's likeness that was lost, as I say, in the fall. Just as Adam represented humanity's disobedience, Christ represented perfection, obedience, especially evidence in his crucifixion, which undid Adam's disobedience by Christ's obedience to the will of the Father in going to the cross. The interpretation of Paul's writing contributed to the development of a theory of atonement that now focuses on Christ's reversal of Adam's action, rather than the purely ritualistic or legalistic understandings of, of redemption through obedience to Old Testament laws and sacrifices. Irenaeus also believed that the resurrection of Adam was assured through Christ's victory over death. He emphasized Christ's victory over sin, reconciliation, and the restoration, the potential restoration of all humanity 
through his incarnation and sacrificial death. Now, Irenaeus to this day remains of considerable importance as a source of information and arguments against the various Gnostic attacks on the church throughout history. His defense against heresy, as I say it's often called today, is the go-to text in countering these perspectives. Irenaeus played the pivotal role in combating these early heresies, particularly that of Gnosticism, which threatened to distort the core tenets of the Christian faith, and still pops up and tries to do that in our day. In his response at that time, Irenaeus vigorously defends the orthodox understanding of Christ's humanity and divinity, and he emphasised the importance of Jesus' incarnation and earthly life as redemption of this material world by coming and being amongst us. This seminal work against heresies remains the foundational text in Christian theology to provide a robust defense of the orthodox beliefs, particularly against all these types of heretical distortions. Irenaeus, you could also say, was the one who initially contributed most significantly to the development of early Christian doctrines. His theological framework laid groundwork for later developments in Christian soteriology, influencing systematic theologians down through the ages. Additionally, you could say his emphasis on the unity of the church as the body of Christ underscores the importance of Christian unity and the authority that we have inherited within it and how it serves as a bulwark, not only against sectarianism, secularization, but also against any form of division and creates a sense of fostering worldwide unity among believers that he says is inspired and equipped by the Holy Spirit. Now today still, there are many contemporary religious sects, Christian religious sects too, or who claim to be Christian religious sects, who draw their influence from these Gnostic beliefs. Now, although their practices and interpretations vary widely, I'd like to close by giving you a few examples of them today. First of all, the New Age movement. Well, you might say that's not a single religious sect, and that's true, but the New Age movement in general encompasses a broad range of spiritual beliefs and practices, many of which are highly influenced by Gnostic ideas. New Age teachings often emphasize the pursuit of personal enlightenment and the existence of special hidden spiritual truths and the importance of transcending material reality, all of which align with key Gnostic concepts that Irenaeus strongly refuted. Mormonism, I'm sure you know of it, officially known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS sometimes referred to, shares many similarities with certain Gnostic ideas, particularly in its belief about divine knowledge and cosmology and the nature of reality and these levels of spiritual enlightenment in the sense that they're only revealed to some, the people they call their prophets. Mormons believe in an ongoing revelation through these prophets and a personal connection to the divine, the divine not only comes through the Holy Spirit and prayer, as Orthodox Christians would believe, but also through secret spiritual rituals and experiences. The emphasis on direct communication with God parallels the Gnostic idea, the concept of Gnosis, of, of only being able to achieve that spiritual knowledge through direct experience and rituals. Both Gnosticism and Mormonism offer elaborate cosmological narratives that claim to explain the origin of the universe and the humanity's place within it. But in Mormonism, this belief is expressed through the divine potential of a human being to come like God through obedience to divine commandments and spiritual progression through various levels of enlightenment revealed originally to the prophet and then revealed step by step to adherence to the Mormon religion. This absolutely echoes the Gnostic idea of the divine spark being awakened through special spiritual knowledge and enlightenment. The Gnosis again. Gnostic texts portray Jesus as the revealer of a secret knowledge, 
and Mormon scripture also teaches hidden treasures, treasures of wisdom, the pearl of great price, understanding that these can only be revealed through the faithful, but through special, insightful revelations passed on through ritual. The Church of Scientology. I'm sure you've heard of that with some of its Hollywood celebrity followers. Now, whilst not explicitly labelled as Gnostic, some scholars and critics would say it draws real parallel between aspects of Scientology and Gnostic thought. Scientology is not concept of Thetans as immortal spiritual beings trapped within physical bodies, along with its emphasis on achieving spiritual enlightenment through self-awareness, again, through secret rituals, do you see the pattern here? In this case, it's alien wisdom, revealed wisdom, but bears similar resemblance to Gnostic ideas of the design, divine spark within humanity and the quest for liberation from material constraints. Again, people are forced to go to the mystic, to the, to the person who they themselves have the secret revelation of God, not in the Orthodox Christian view that we all stand before God because of what the right to stand before God because of what Christ has done. Two other final Gnostic groups, I believe one would be the Order of the Golden Dawn. Now this is an esoteric organization founded in the late 19th century and synthesized elements of Western occultism and Gnosticism into its teaching, still presents itself as a Christian sect in many ways. But followers of the Golden Dawn engage in ceremonial magic, esoteric rituals, said to achieve spiritual growth and enlightenment. And they again draw upon Gnostic themes of inner th transformation through the quest and the revelation for finding secret hidden knowledge. And then finally, the Rosicrucian Order, another esoteric fraternity with its roots in the Catholic Church of the Renaissance. The Rosicrucian tradition incorporates Gnostic elements into its teaching, particularly regarding the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment again and the pursuit of this esoteric will wisdom. Followers again of the Rosicrucian order engage in secret mystical practices aimed at uncovering hidden truths of existence and attaining spiritual liberalization. And attaining spiritual freedom. All these examples, and I could name others, and influences thing in things like uh, Freemasonry and many others, they all illustrate the diverse range of contemporary religious movements and, and philosophical groups that are still influenced by Gnostic thought of each day, each with its own slightly different interpretation, its own set of practices, its own set perhaps of rules and rituals, but all rooted in the quest for this secret spiritual knowledge and this closed form of enlightenment. The prevalence and activity of such organizations as these, even to this day, show us the relevance of Irenaeus's teachings for us to this day. So in conclusion, Irenaeus's great contribution to the, great, to the Christian church and church history are manifold and enduring. His strong defence against heresy and the development of an early systematic Christian doctrine, coupled with his emphasis on ecclesiastical unity, church unity, a unity of faith among the believers, continued to shape Christian theology and practice to this day, making him a vital figure in the ongoing history of the Christian Church. Thanks to Irenaeus and those who followed in his footsteps, Orthodox Christianity continues just about to triumph over all these attacks of Gnosticisms, not just the early ones, but those who equip them, give them the tools to still do that today. But these emerging agnostic ideas and sects still keep appearing in the church and in the secular world, still promising new scriptures and fresh revelations of God. Thankfully, we can turn to God's word and to the writings of great men, early men of church faith, like Irenaeus, in our understanding and refutation of them. Thanks for being with me today.
Okay, that's it for today. I do hope you find that interesting and helpful. If you're here for the first time, then why not click on the subscribe button? And that way, every time I post a new episode, you'll get a notification to say there's a new episode available. I'm going to try and do one once every one or two weeks, but that will depend on A, financial support being enough to keep meeting the costs of them, and B, time involved uh, on this project alongside all my other main podcasting projects. There are links to everything I do and everything I create and also the place where you can support this ministry. You can support this podcast series if that's what you feel called to do. So thank you for being with me here today and I do hope to see you on my History of the Christian Church, 2000 Years of Christian Thought, a history of the church through the ideas and thinking of some of the great men and women in church's history. So with that all said, I'll say bye-bye for now.